everybody. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Happy Friday. Thanks so much for joining me. Mm. <laughs> I have to tell you, I cleaned up so much for you and um, I hope, uh, I've never actually given a studio tour um, like this before. So I'm excited to share some things with you and um, I've made a little list of questions that some of you gave me and if you have any more, just give me a shout and um, a message and I'll do my best to answer all of them. So thank you, thank you. Um, well, I thought I would start by just actually taking you around my studio and I want to thank you for the opportunity to get organized because I tell you, having like six months of pandemic and a daughter who's the most like prolific artist and drawer, she's taken over my studio and we finally were able to go through a bunch of her um, papers and clear up. And um, so I'm going to turn around my camera and I'll try not to wobble too much here. Um, oh, hello from the Netherlands. And um, so I want to say that um, my studio has been like a super iterative process. I've lived in a bunch of places where I've worked and like in each place, we slowly, you know, develop the furniture a little bit. Hey, Jerome, and try and like upgrade it. And so this is like, you know, since 2006, slowly um, improving it. And one thing I'm really happy about is pushing the drawers here. A couple years ago, I finally got a flat file, this really massive one that my father-in-law um, got for free when this um, boat company he'd been working with closed. And so it's this huge flat file um, made of wood and I painted it and we spruced it up and put little like chalkboard paper here to label things. So that's been a huge help. For years I worked on a drafting table and I know that paper management as an artist is um, really challenging. So that's been a help. Um, and I have a little cobbled together bookcase here with my miscellaneous tools and sketches. My husband gave me a toolbox for one of my birthdays, this old Kennedy that he painted that is lovingly dented. Um, when we bought this house, there were no closets in this room. So we built this closet. I still need to paint the door, but um, I'll get there. And uh, there's one of my new pieces of art by uh, Jerome Cooler Bandit. Um, I uh, love hanging things and trying to make tools accessible. So for my brushes, um, I have square dowels that I've bolted into my wall. So you can just see I've got a little screw here. And then I took like finishing nails and then just every inch tapped them in. So some of my brushes that don't have little strings, I've just gone ahead and used like a little plumber's tape or um, electrical tape and taped on some thread. Um, this little Princeton brush, I drilled a hole through. I, I should have planned my drill out better. It's a little off center. <laughs> um, but anyways, this keeps things really nicely organized and I've got um, more of my brushes here. Uh, I'm really spoiled. A lot of these are made by my uh, dear friend in Tokyo who I met when I was about 11. And this is the brush that before I left Japan, he made for me out of my own hair. Um, so it's in this elk handle. Um, I've never painted with it. It's more of a souvenir, but um, my brush maker friend told me that it was a coming of age gift. Um, and it's always represented to me like the importance of art in my life and connecting across friendships, um, cultures, languages. Uh, so really symbolizes a lot to me. Um, I also, oh, here's this awesome art. I also got from Amanda Reed, calligrapher, um, that I'm so psyched. I'll get around to framing this soon. So my other framing system or hanging system rather uses these really cool like spacer nuts and then long bolts and picture hanging wire. And I love this because then when I'm working, I can put notes up, art to inspire me. There's a little sketch by Nikki Frumpkin, John to High Places, and Lisa, some work by Lisa. Um, so I love being able to hang my work and keep it out and uh, visible. Um, so my desk, I made out of melamine. I got my own just big, great piece of melamine, which is uh, really inexpensive. And you can cut it down. And I made a big shelf next to me because 
when I work, I really like to be in the middle of kind of my chaos that usually happens when, um, when I start working. Over here I've got, this is the first desk I bought in 2006 from Ikea. It's this great folding table that in every studio it sort of changed. And right now it's a little stationary where I just keep kind of my like, you know, my drawer of rubber bands. Oh my gosh, I love rubber bands, clips, um, pens, just keep some of my miscellaneous goodies in here. And right now I've got some bins I've been stacking underneath. Not crazy about that, but it, it works. Um, and uh, bookshelf, we've had a lot of fun making furniture. Ikea countertops have been something that have been a big part of um, me and my husband building some of our own desks. And I'll, I'll come on over here. A um, little bit of my work on the walls. Um, this painting is a piece that's uh, the biggest watercolor I've ever done at five feet wide uh, about a helicopter flying but inspired by riding in a helicopter over Baffin Bay looking for narwhals with a marine mammal biologist, a friend of mine, Kristen Lydra. Across the street, oh, you're getting a peek. That's this new school that was built, and I'm actually really pleased. They're buying one of my paintings that I'll be delivering later this month, um, which I'm hoping my, my daughter will get to enjoy seeing eventually. Um, I'm well organized today. Like I said, you all inspired me. These desks were all covered in papers this morning. So honestly, it hasn't been this clean in like six months. Um, so this is our sit down desk and these are these Ikea countertops. And we used to have all sit down and then we really wanted a stand up station. So a friend of mine welded together this um, cool desk for our printer that's part of our sit station. And then we used a uh, pipe. I love this, this black pipe to be one end of um, our standing desk, and then built another taller desk over here. So that's been really nice, and we have foot mats to make it more comfortable when we stand, and then the um, sit station. And this kind of doubles as my sewing. I really love tinkering with a sewing machine when I have a chance, and finally was able to get my supplies more organized um, in one of these IKEA roller cabinets, so that's been handy. and. Uh, yeah, and then I'll show you. <laughs> this is the first time my daughter's desk has been clear in like a, uh, a month. Um, she just burns through paper and drawings and I love them so much. She's five, year old, uh, five years old now. Here's a little picture of her holding one of our cats. Um, we actually just got a little harness for this cat who's an indoor cat and has been taking that cat outside for breakfast picnics the past couple mornings. Uh, so this is an Ikea desk and then we adapted this with a little extra like hanging bar so we could hang her pens on that for a little workspace. Um, and then this is the back of my big table. Eventually I'd like to like build another shelf or something uh, on it so I can hide like all my great big sheets of paper. Um, so this is where I, I keep my big stuff and it's uh, a little, I'd like it to look a little nicer. Um, on my desk, I can set up a big, long dowel. I put it in my clamp on the other end. I have a, a piece of wood here that struts up. Um, so when I do product photography and stuff, I can, I can use that. Over the past few years, I've acquired a few lights. And, oh, and then finally, these are some cute cabinets I picked up a couple years ago um, for some of my sketchbook storage. I could probably use some more sketchbook storage. <laughs> and uh, art supplies and tape collections. So um, yeah, I think that's it for my studio. Um, all in all, I think like, you know, I was reflecting on my space and how it's worked for me. And I just think, you know, I really started with the most simple um, of desks, right? And it was really over like 14 years of tinkering. Like we um, moved, I think we lived in like seven places in five years, my husband and I, when we first were together and then married. And now we've been in this house four years and it's the longest um, we've ever lived anywhere. So, um, you know, if you start with just uh, giving yourself a corner with some of your supplies and then slowly um, develop your workspace and be patient with yourself and try and buy things that you're gonna like for the, the long term. Um, so uh, I got some really great questions that um, I wanted to try and answer um, some about some supplies and colors. 
Um, and if you have any other questions that come up, um, just let me know. So I'm just gonna flip my camera. Let's see here. I have a little stool my husband helped build me to stand up so I can peek down at my camera while demonstrating. Uh, so I got a really good question from William saying, hey, do you have any thoughts for uh, selecting a limited palette? And so I wanted to just talk through a couple tips for that. And um, one is, is that I think, you know, these essential colors are a really a little dirty here. Fabulous place to start. I love my uh, paper towel. Um, because you, you can really do so much with these six colors. And Lisa Spangler at Side Oats uh, put together this really cool color guide collaborating with a few artists that's a fundraiser for social justice. And um, she's got, uh, you can check out a whole range of mixes that you can do just with these, these six colors. So if you're starting out painting, I think there's a lot of value in starting with a limited palette of six colors or even taking yourself down to three so that you understand how to mix them. So starting to mix, say, a brown, you get your orange and, um, oh, I'm seeing some good questions. I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, get your orange and then go to a blue or mix in a blue, the complement. So that'll start to get you your ochres and umbers and um, neutrals. And once you understand to do that, how to, how to get these neutrals of siennas and umbers or even um, a black, uh, I showed a couple, maybe it was last week, how to do a phthalo blue plus pyrrhal scarlet for a really sweet um, deep gray. So then you can start adding in colors for convenience, uh, like a sienna. So this sienna color, now you don't have to take the time to mix sienna. You've got it as a shortcut color. So that could be any sort of brown that you are you know, drawn to, one that maybe granulates more or one that um, is just a, a straight up brown or ochre. And then similarly, once you've gotten comfortable mixing some greens, you know, maybe you'll wanna add in a shortcut green for when you're out sketching. So you know, here's just mixing a simple French ultramarine together with uh, yellow and you can skew that green more earthy or brighter. And once you're comfortable with that, here's a, a pretty classic green of sap green that you can start carrying. And um, other shortcut colors that I think can be really convenient, a little neutral tint for sketching. So with these extra colors, now I'm up to nine. And then again, you might just think about something else fun. Um, maybe it's a purple, Maybe it's adding in a buff titanium or a white gouache so you can get some of these sandy colors and give yourself a set of nine to 12 um, basic colors. So uh, that's a few tips just on some thoughts of developing your palette. Um, so a couple questions. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't realize my um, was off screen there. Um, here's that Pyrrhal Scarlet and uh, Thalo Blue Green Shade. Um, green roll on the side of my desk. I, when I work, I really like to prop up my paintings if I'm working larger so that paint can flow. So I keep a few objects. This happens to be a beautiful object my father gave me um, from his oceanography studio. Um, it's, it's a glass, kind of a magnifying glass, and uh, it's just beautiful. I'm, I'm a little bit like a crow. I'm, I'm drawn to having sort of beautiful, interesting objects around um, similarly, I have, um, for larger work, I keep a big, few big chunks of wood. Our previous landlord um, had these gorgeous beams that were reclaimed, and he gave us some chunks um, that were varnished and really beautiful. Um, so I, I like to prop my, my work up for it to flow. And storing paint tubes is a really good question. Um, and um, right now... My paint tombs aren't incredibly organized. I keep them all in a big drawer. But I think it's Liz Steele. 
that I may have seen some organization from her where um, she put her crimped her paint tubes um, with clips and created a hanging system for those. Um, so just to show an example, and I think this is cool. It's been on my, my little list of ideas. You've got a crimped paint tube and you can get these cool paint crimpers too, tube ringers rather, and then you can hang them. So if you've got a board with um, nails in it or little bolts, you can hang them, which I think is a really cool idea. Um, kind of on my list. <laughs> um, so I had uh, another question I wanted to answer about travel brushes. And this was also from William. And William was asking me about what travel brushes I most often carry. And um, I'm a big fan of... Uh, rosemary water brush, excuse me, travel brushes. I like, I like water brushes a lot too, but when I'm in the field, these are just like so handy and, um, and I, they, they've spoiled me a little bit. I, I have a collection and it's sort of trouble because I, I really like testing things out and playing with them. So on one level, I'm always experimenting with supplies and then I also get my go-to favorites. Um, and one that I've just been using a lot cause it's just so durable and flexible is their R10 um, synthetic. It's got a nice flexible point. Um, and I can zoom this in a little bit more. Um, just a really lovely brush. It's also a little um, less expensive too. So if you're starting out, um, oh, hi, Nina. So nice to have you join me. Um, if you're just starting out and you know wanting to try a travel brush, I think this is a great one. I'm hoping we'll have some more stock of theirs soon. We've got um, an order en route to us. Including, I'm gonna jump ahead of myself a little, um, their new eradicator. That's gonna be the travel eradicator. And this is really cute and I, I'm kind of honored they are including my art um, in the packaging. And so this is like a teeny tiny cute little brush that you can use for like windows, little, um, little fine marks, um, cause it's this little tiny flat. But then the cool thing about it is, I should have come prepared. I don't know, this paint might be too dry. Um, but the eradicator, oh, Dallas, hi, thanks for joining. Um, the eradicator is kind of like your little eraser. So you can get it clean, wipe it in water, dry it off, and you can lift colors with it. Um, and so this is one that I'm looking forward to carrying more. Just like when you need to pull out these little brights or do some little marks, I'm thinking, you know, for me, maybe little icebergs or such. And um, I'll have a, a small batch of about 40 coming in soon and then a lot more. Um, they may already be listed on their website. I'm not sure. We're, we're all, um, you know, working on keeping inventory happening. So anyways, this is a really fun one that I'm looking forward to keeping as available as possible um, on our website the eradicator. Um, and then the other go-tos, um, we'll have more of these soon as well, is um, I, uh, I love um, the squirrel. Um, I, I grew up, as you, as you saw with my brush collection, I've really grown up painting with these um, soft animal hair Japanese brushes. And so part of what I enjoy is this like, you know, flexible brush where it holds a lot of water and pigment. So this squirrel feels really familiar to me. And, um, and with an animal hair brush, I, I do believe, uh, you know, that use it well, take care of it, and they'll last a really long time. And, um, and this squirrel, I just think, is, is really fun to paint with and great quality with the amount of pigment it carries for... Um, and uh, yeah, to answer a question, I think we are expecting a shipment of squirrels and eradicators. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be a smaller batch of eradicators to start. They just put together 40 for us, I think. But we'll, we'll have more coming in soon, too. And yes, we'll have um, more squirrels really shortly. And um, so, yeah, these. Um, and then finally, and now my collection's getting larger. This is trouble. Um, and um, I see a couple other questions about the rosemary. Um, I believe the eradicator is synthetic as well. 
and the R9 is in th synthetic. The R12 Dagger, um, this is really fun too. And another that I like to have around to play with, um, you know, in my kit. I guess I stuff a lot of these into my kit is what it's starting to look like. And uh, I should pull out my art tool kit and show you. Um, but you know, this is just a fun brush because you can do these little angles, like kind of use it as a stamp, push it down, pop it up, um, hold it more on its side for these more flat marks. And, um, and then you can, you know, lay down the point and play with lifting up and down. So, um, <laughs> So this, this is another another fun one. Starting out, I might say, hey, just try a, you know, a couple rounds. You can do basically anything with a round. It's kind of like with the essential colors, pick up, you know, one or two nice brushes. And then as you get to know what you're doing, you can go for a couple fun specialty. So I'm going to have to pull out, we've got the bigger dagger too, which is just cool as you scale up to work bigger. And um, I need to check our stock on these. And... Um, Let's see, Dallas, I don't know yet the um, price. Uh, I, I don't have it in my head of the squirrel. And that's a great question. I'm not 100% certain the eradicator is synthetic. I will, I'll check on that. Um, Y'all are keeping me honest. Um, and yeah, the R5, where is my R5? Did I not, I might not have, oh, here we go. Um, so this is another one of those specialty brushes that I'm partial to but it's kind of like those extra colors, like get to know how to mix your green and then see if you'll enjoy, you know, having something like this that really does carry a lot more um, pigment and can do these really fun, long lines, fine lines. And um, I've been enjoying this with doing like little studies of um, plants outside and things there. And um, it, this one also, similar to the squirrel, carries a nice amount of water and is flexible. So again, it reminds me of some of my experience with um, um, Japanese brushes that I've grown up painting with. Um, so let's see here. Oh, I saw a great question back there about the um, uh, lifting, if lifting works better with certain pigments. And yes, <laughs> so um, I, let's see here. I should grab my color guide. Hang on one second. Um, I can see what I'm looking for here. So this is the sort of thing you only really need to do once with your paints. And um, if you take workshops with me, I usually pull this out to show off too, which is just to explore the properties of your watercolor paints. Because watercolors can be staining versus non-staining. That means how much they stick to the paper. Thalos are kind of notorious for being more staining. And a little bit of thalo goes like a really long way. So um, here I, I laid out these swatches of color over a big black Sharpie line I made. Because then you can also see their opacity because that's another property of paint. How much they sit on the surface. Let's find a really opaque one. Here's this Windsor & Newton oxide chromium that's basically like gouache or <clears throat> this um, buff titanium that really sits on the surface. And then with the staining, I lay down some tape on either side and used paint brushes and like a sponge and really tried to scrub it up. So lifting will work better with pigments that are less staining. It's gonna be really hard no matter what you do to pick up phthalo blue. Cerulean blue pops right off the page there. Um, so, Checking in on my questions. Um, I had a um, great question from, let's see, maybe I'll just pop back up here and say hello to you all. Um, I'm trying to get a little less shy <laughs> actually being on camera. Um, so I had some questions about resources, um, Juhi on getting started sketching, and Julie was also asking about tips for improving um, sketching skills. And I'm pulling out a little book here. Um, I've been having a lot of fun sharing um, and we'll be doing this for, <clears throat> um, and yeah, I'll be, I'll be archiving this along with our other live demos. Um, I've been enjoying taking a look through my um, bookshelf and sharing some of my favorite books. And I'll continue doing that because um, I think, you know, picking up one or two 
uh, nice books. Um, oh, and here's, uh, oh good, thanks, thanks for the uh, commentary on the um, synthetics and rosemary. Um, so um, having one or two good resources, I think can be really inspiring. I've accrued a bit of a, a collection <laughs> over the years. And um, one that I just really like for like watercolor painting that I'll be featuring soon on our feed is this Complete Watercolorist Essential Notebook by Gordon McKenzie. I've had this book um, pretty much since I started painting. And it just is a terrific resource for different brush techniques and washes and different subject matters. A little more landscape focused. My personal painting affinity tends to be more landscape. I, I love to push myself more with people sometimes, but that's that tends to be where I go. But um, I thought I'd pull this out as one resource. And for nature drawing and journaling, there's so many, um, you know, uh, Jack Laws, John Muir Laws is just fabulous and highly recommend his book. Um, another one that's a little more of a loose approach, and actually I should grab one more. Um, this, this woman's local and um, it's just a Pacific Northwest nature notebook. And it's a little less sort of on the science rigorous side and more on some of the journaling um, side of things and really lovely. There's also, uh, I'll go grab it, Claire Leslie Walker. Um, and she's someone who I discovered many years ago too when I was getting into field sketching. And so she's got keeping a nature journal. Um, and so um, I'd say she's sort of in between Jude Siegel and um, John Muir Laws as a resource of um, a little more journaly versus uh, really bringing together the art and science and um, observation. So I hope those resources help. One thing too I think about is just practice. You know, drawing is um, one of those things that the more you do it, the easier it gets. And it kind of like a muscle you flex. And um, I do think a really wonderful spot to start can be with figure sketching and gesture drawing. Um, I hold up this Pacific Northwest book again. This is a Pacific Northwest nature sketchbook by um, Jude Siegel. And in the coming weeks too, I'll go ahead and um, give this a shout out on our, our feed as well. It's a beautiful book. Um, and, um, but people and gesture drawing, um, I took a figure drawing class in college that was really inspiring to me. Um, in saying that the figure applies to everything, the whole landscape. Because with the figure, you're looking at angles, you're looking at measuring, um, you're really practicing some of these draftsman skills and perspective. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's something you can do at home, whether it's drawing your feet or your hands or your family or, or you know, your animals also as some inspiration and thinking about how no matter what you're practicing, even on a small scale, doing things daily, it will um, translate into everything else you do. And I think that three to five minutes of practice is more effective than like, you know, once a week going, oh, I'm really gonna go do something just to keep that little journal, which is, you know, part of what I'm, I'm passionate about with the idea of, you know, the art toolkit where um, I, you know, this is really my carry everywhere kit. So even if I have a few minutes, you know, my sketchbook is a place for me to not worry about things being perfect. You know, here's at the beach, I was just looking at, um, some color studies of just the water and messing around. And so I'd say just giving yourself permission to mess around every day really helps with that, um, that practice and starting to develop your voice and seeing what materials and subjects um, really resonate with you. Um, so um, I have a couple other questions. Uh, one was just saying, have you ever thought of a col collaboration with Case for Making? I have such a friend crush on Case for Making. I'll have to reach out to them sometime. Thanks for the nudge. <laughs> um, and uh, I totally welcome suggestions from all of you as well. If you, um, you know, have any artists or, you know, people in mind that you think might be interesting to collaborate with or feature, just, um, you know, send me a note. And um, that's been to me one of the, the, the upsides of this challenging pandemic is I've really just felt so much more connected to all of you in this sense of community. That's really meant a lot. Um, okay, a couple other questions. 
I think I'm gonna jump to a little bit of um, talking about some of my expeditions um, and pulled out a few sketches. Let me just clear um, my little brush collection here and I'm gonna flip to my desk and, oops, sorry about those lights up there. Um, so, uh, oh, and I had one other question too, just about the palettes before I put these away. Of someone asking me if I've ever had um, problems with the paints running off of my palette. And I haven't. Um, I think part of it may be, oops, I've got a little tape on that one so it wouldn't scoot around, is um, I really like to clip my palettes. Oh, here's me messing around with my brush pen. Um, when I work, I often keep my palettes a little bit inclined. And um, I like that they can be clipped to the side of the sketchbook. I'm not working on. So sometimes I'll get a little collection of water um, down here, but that ha hasn't um, run off the top. Um, so it hasn't been a problem for me yet. And on the palette note, I'm just gonna show you something in the works, just for fun, um, that uh, you can think about what this might be going with. But I, I'm uh, always working on new ideas, and this is, um, a little something else that I'm starting to tinker with in the studio. Um, so, uh, oh, thanks, you, you all are making me, thanks for all the love. <laughs> um, alrighty, um, so expeditions. Um, Juhi was asking me about um, research experiences and um, some of um, vessels I've been on and experiences. and. Um, I thought I'd pull up this painting. This is a field painting um, of a glacier up in Canada. Um, what really helped kick off some of my experiences working with scientists was um, doing uh, participating in what's with what's called the Juno Icefield Research Program, and that helped hook me up with glaciologists. Helped my own understanding of glaciers and ice, and I personally really began to fall in love with this environment. And so I spent two summers up there. First as a student, um, they um, they had an amazing scholarship that helped me go up there in high school. And oh my gosh, this was 1999. And then I went back in 2003 as an artist in residence and um, staff member to support the program again and big inspiration and this particular piece I did afterwards with one of my friends from the program Matthew Beadle um, so we went up this is called Castle Glacier we were up on a lookout looking at it and um, I you know in the field I just love I love ice some of the exploring the forms this is a, a sketch from 2007 of Mount Baker um, and let's see here I'll zoom in a little here um, and so this was, um, I've done some local work with scientists. I got to go out with some glaciology teams monitoring the North Cascades Mountains, one with the National Park, and then another with this North Cascades Research Project that's just about to embark on another season. Um, and spent time on our glaciers as well with a really wonderful program called Inspiring Girls Expeditions that's targeted to, to give underprivileged girls an opportunity free uh, to learn about art and science and um, some sort of outdoor pursuit. Started out with glaciology I've done there, um, helped with their kayaking program and, up in Alaska, and they've got rock climbing now. Um, so really, really wonderful. Um, and working, working with scientists there, a big mentor of mine is a woman, Erin Pettit. Um, she is a, a total inspiration of um, glaciologists and working in Antarctica, Alaska, and doing so much for education. Um, and so um, with, I was thinking about ves vessels, and I don't have a lot of sketches of vessels, but one thing is I'm, I'm, I love sketching transport. Like, I really like sketching planes and helicopters. Um, and, like, the process of how we travel really interests me. And this is one particular helicopter. The pilot said, well, hey, now, you know, it was one they were working on. He's like, don't just sketch the broken helicopter. But it, it wasn't broken for long. And um, this particular sketch was when, on my first trip after college, I had a fellowship to travel and paint and um, spent about three and a half, four months in Greenland. So I was kind of hitchhiking helicopters um, with some um, diamond hunters, people's prospective diamond geologists. And it's kind of another story how I got abandoned overnight at a diamond hunter's camp. Um, 
Needless to say, I was glad to see them come back. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a, a painting done on toned paper of a twin otter on that same trip um, on red paper. And uh, yeah, aircraft, I don't know, they have so much personality. And when you're in remote places, they, they're such a big part of accessing them. So with scientists in Greenland, I've had the privilege of working with my friend, um, Kristen Lydra, this um, marine mammal biologist studying narwhals and polar bears. And her colleague in um, North East Greenland studying walruses on another trip. Um, this is one of our cute little aircraft. And um, when I was in Greenland many, many years ago, um, the NSF was kind enough to grant me uh, permission to take a um, C-130 Hercules aircraft. I wish I had a picture to show you of the aircraft um, all the way up to the middle of the Greenland ice cap. And here's that um, station up there. You can see their little tent city. And at that time, with all the accumulation of the snow, one of their primary buildings was actually under the snow. And I think that might have been where I slept. Um, so I was just so grateful for their support and the opportunity to visit some of these places. Um, and uh, my, my experiences in Antarctica have been with expedition tour ships as artists in residence. Um, so those haven't been as science focused, but I, I feel really passionate about science. Um, <laughs> I pulled out, did I pull out one more of these? I pulled out a couple of these. Um, this is just a cute little, um, um, I got really into birds and bergs, all the seagulls hanging out on icebergs. Um, I've also um, was able to join a field team um, friend of mine. You might recognize these from, um, I featured these with uh, a few weeks ago on our Instagram. Um, uh, ornithologist studying Hudsonian godwits. It was really fun to join him. And um, while in the field, I not only try and sketch the research, but also explore um, what's happening or, you know, the habitat and bits of that. Um, and most recently, he's actually up in the Arctic right now um, for his field season again. I was in um, Alaska last summer. And, you know, I had to say it's been really challenging. Here's um, a field sketch out looking. Um, this is with George DeVoke, uh ornithologist studying um, pigeon guillemots. And this is his, now he's on his 45th consecutive summer. It's this incredibly long ranging project. And um, I'm really hoping I can start to develop this work in my studio soon. Um, I did a lot of sketching while up there. They're super cute little birds. And um, it, uh, I'm just waiting for a little more childcare <laughs> so I can get some of my uninterrupted studio time. Um, those of you with kids, I'm sure can relate that. Um, um, thank you for the, the compliments, everybody. Um, out overlooking the the Arctic, and this was on the North Slope of Alaska with George, and um, what part of what I love is just in the these spaces where there's really limited landscape elements. What is there is just all the more beautiful. The, these vast skies, the subtle colors of the land or the ice, and here the the wildlife. Um, and um, let's see. Here. And then I wanted to give you a peek at a project. I'm really had like so much fun with too. So I'm just on the science note is um, I had the opportunity a couple years ago to um, go to with NASA. They have what's called a social program. So they accepted, you can apply it to go to like their launches and their events and um, help them basically reach new audiences. And so this is a sketch I did right before this rocket was launched, taking um, an ice um, ISAT-2, this satellite that is now orbiting us and monitoring with really cool technology our ice as well as things like our canopy cover worldwide. It's got this laser. So anyways, that, that was a really fun project. And um, oh, I sketchbook's a little buried there, but here's up close to the rocket. So I kind of geek out with some of these um, techie, <laughs> like sketching tools and uh, I've got a lot more tool sketches and such um, that really delight me of that process. Like, what are the different tools we all use to explore um, the world? And, you know, art is my main medium, but there's all these other cool tools, whether it's, you know, satellites or um, aircraft or, you know, woodworking tools for just seeing the, um, the world. 
Um, so I've got a, a couple other questions um, that I'll, I'll try and answer. And um, Angela is asking about what paper size to take into the field. And so um, <laughs> let's see here. Maybe I'll flip this around and I might be able to share a couple of little things with you. Um, so paper size is kind of tricky and I experiment. Um, like for my trip last summer, I cut down this big um, case that I could carry on the airplane with me for an artboard support. This is about for sheets that are uh, 15 by, or about that. It's like 30 inches plus wide. So I, I, um, I've come to a range of sizes that I like, and I got some good advice from an artist year to, years ago who said paint in consistent sizes, because if you're buying frames to exhibit, really helps to reuse those frames so to not reinvent the wheel so you can paint in your own interesting formats but it's nice to be able to swap them out so over the years i i've gravitated towards a number of sizes i love seeing the world in kind of this panoramic format um it's about six and a half by i don't know maybe 15 inches wide if i remember correctly um so what i'll do is i'll pre-cut myself a whole mess of paper and i have a little formula for like my goals for sketching. And so I try to do in the field um, three to five sketches a day. And so I try to plan for paper. And I tell myself that it would be a really good problem to run out of paper, because that would mean I'd be sketching a lot, right? Because there's the anxiety. You're like, what if I use up all my paper? Like, no, 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 that would be such a good problem to have. Um, so whenever you're out sketching and you're thinking, oh, do I have enough paper or you're on a trip? dive in and use it as much as you can, is my advice. Because um, then out of all that practice, maybe some pieces you're a little more pleased with will come out. And when I do three to five sketches, that might be some gesture sketches and um, uh, some, you know, or like an intensive hour, hour and a half long study. But to me, I get gold stars for like anything on paper. Um, so uh, let's see here. Do I take reference photos in the field or rely on my field sketches? I do take reference photos and I rely on my field sketches. So it's a mix for me of the sketches really helping to inform, like um, inform like the mood of what I wanna capture and the subject matters and some of the energy because I paint differently outside than inside. And then when I'm in my studio, there's things that I just don't necessarily have time to do outside or some of the ways I like to paint for my um, studio work that is very even and kind of this atmospheric is really hard to attain in the, um, in the field. So um, I, I uh, definitely do reference material. Um, when I pack colors for expeditions, um, so depending how long the expedition is, um, you know, these I've been, I, I really love this set. I, you've seen them in photos probably, and it's my set of warm and cools. That's way more colors than you actually need. But um, it, uh, when I go on a trip, I often like to take a few extra in case I encounter some new palettes and want to play with something new. Um, and um, I'll sometimes carry some tubes, um, like white gouache. I really like to have a little fresh gouache um, because it can be a little juicier. and. Um, someone was asking me about what paper I work on, and um, this is even dating back to 2005, and this is um, Canson Mitient um, paper, Mitientes, I never know if I pronounced it right. So it's a lighter weight paper that um, is, I think, marketed and used for pastels. Um, and I really, I really love sketching on it. I also, um, this is also Canson Mitients, I love their sand. Um, I just started playing around a little bit sketchbook wise with um, Hannah Moulet is doing, let's see if I can pull this one out. I haven't messed around with this too much, but they, um, they make a toned paper in a sketchbook. Um, a little heavier version of a toned paper that I use a lot is, oh my, let's see if I can pull it out for you. Here's one. Um, it's called um, Arches Cover. And so it's not a true watercolor paper but it's very soft. It can take some washes of paint. And I don't know, there's something about it I really love, just the feel of it and um, working on it. Um, so, you know, if I'm going out on an extended trip, I'll definitely, you know, 
say like two weeks, maybe I'll take um, a few extra colors like blues, you know, if I, I know I'm gonna be kind of sky heavy or some of my extra neutrals. But um, I really try and top off my paints before I go. I've learned not to like fly with all my paints and then try and fill them up in the hotel room like the night before I go in the field because it does take a little while for them to cure. And if you really let them, you know, fill them, let them really dry, it might even take a day or two depending on your climate and then top them off again. These carry a lot of paint. Um, so um, yeah, all these are often in my toolkit, um, kind of my extended kit. Uh, I've been playing a lot lately with some little baby palettes, um, Demi palettes and a mixing palette. So this is my current mixing palette. Um, I brought this one to Alaska too for a little extra space. And I need to change out my little pan here, but I, I like to do a white gouache and then a neutral. Um, when I was in Alaska, I kept hematite in it, which granulates. Um, and you know, neutral tint is another fun color or Jane's gray is fabulous. Um, and then I've been, playing with, you know, some of our Demi's, um, like the essentials. And um, <laughs> this one I dropped in the sand. This was inspired by my friend Che's palette. And um, he's been, been on, on two of, of our lives. He's one of my real favorite art friends who, um, I mean, before most expeditions, I'm calling Che up and geeking out about color because my husband's tired of hearing me agonize about this or that. Um, so this is a fun, a fun set that you can go back and, and check out our demo together. Um, yeah, sand, sand is tricky and I, I live near a beach. Um, so let's see here. Um, I saw a question about books for getting started with um, gesture sketching or, or suggestions. Um, and that's really a great question. Um, you're gonna get a little sneak peek at um, uh, a book that I like and I'm planning on featuring this one in our, um, in our feed too. So here it is now. This is Sketch Now, Think Later by a really cool urban sketcher, Mike Yoshiaki Daikubara. Daikubara. Um, and what I love about this book is he really focuses about like just diving in and some of that gesture and not worrying about getting things right and that practice of just having your pen ready your paints ready and going out. And now I have to show you a sketchbook of mine. Um, let's see, I think I just tucked it away. So his book, the, the Sketch Now Think Later, was a big inspiration for me, for my NASA sketchbook that I did um, last year, where in about four or five, I think it was three to four days, I filled up this entire sketchbook and um, from sketching introductions to the scientists, um, learning about the satellite, to um, being told that I couldn't sketch because we were in top secret areas. They said, no phones, no photos, no radio devices. And I thought, ha, I've got my sketchbook. And everyone's like, go Maria. I was the only person sketching. They're like, you've got to record everything. And then we get into this one room and they, they, they called me out and I had to pack up my, um, my sketchbook. Um, but this was a cool one just because I, I really was just carrying my one sketch pen and then my, my art toolkit. But 90% of the time I was just sketching standing up with my sketchbook, my palette clipped to it and my pen and my water brush in one hand and a little paper towel and just like flying. And it was so fun. And I was really letting go of perfection. and. That's one thing that I think um, that book, Sketch Now, Think Later, um, is a good inspiration for. Um, uh, oh, thanks for all the encouragement to put together, put together books. I, I'd like to. I have two little books that I think I should make available again. I'll, I'll get a little peek for you. Um, this is one I put together years ago called High Latitudes that just includes a few of my um, sketches from Antarctica and... Um, Greenland, and uh, let's see, I think I've got a cute one of penguins in here. Um, here's emperor penguins um, being artists in residence. This is on the Capitan Klebnikov. That was one cool vessel, a big uh, Russian icebreaker. Um, and then falling in love with Arctic terns, another passion of mine, traveling between the Arctic and Antarctica. Um, and um, this one is my uh, catalog for the Imaging the Arctic show. So it 
um, and it was an exhibit I put together with my scientist friend, and then um, we brought in another really amazing photographer called Tina Ikonen. Um, so this had a lot of my paintings, um, both studio and field, um, that I, I put together from the trip. Um, so, oh good, well, thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at actually putting these on my website in a visible spot. <laughs> I really appreciate um, the encouragement. And I saw one other question about my artboard, and I'll give you a peek at that and then tell you about a little something I've got that I'm kind of testing out. Um, so, my artboards, let's see here. Oh, here we go. So I do use artboards, and um, I make these out of what's called gator boards. Gator board, board is this really cool, here's one not taped up, um, like, it's like foam core, but it's like super durable, and um, you don't have to apply varnish to it to work on it. Um, so I use this exclusively for my art support now. I used to have like wood, but it was way too heavy, and, and this is brilliant. So um, I have a, a number of portfolios I've made using book cloth tape, and then it opens up, and then I have these little like flaps. Um, my husband made this for me before one of my big trips. Um, one of those, you know, night before the trip, let me try and finish something for you sort of things. And, um, and then it's got elastic. And so what I'm just now testing out is I've ordered supplies for like an eight and a half by 11 little kit that would be like some book tape, some of this um, really nice cloth tape I use, and two gator boards, two rubber bands, and then a little like zip sleeve for it. Um, so um, I'm doing a little prototype run. If I have some extras, I'll, I'll put a little note in my story, or if you're really excited about this idea, maybe send me a, um, a direct message and I'll add you to a list. Um, I, I'm, I do, I, I use Velcro to attach these to a tripod as well, and I, I really need to work on making um, a version I can share, because my tripod hack, it's, it's really, it's not super elegant and, so, and easy to replicate. Um, oh, it's tucked away a little more, otherwise I show you. It's, it's some Velcroed, um, basically camera flash extenders, and not very elegant, so I, I'd, I'd be interested in, um, in doing this. Oh yes, and Stablo. I've seen some cool stuff from them and that, that's a really cool idea to reach out to them. Um, Cause yeah, I like, I like uh, drawing board supports. Um, so yeah, anybody have any other questions? Otherwise I think um, we're just about wrapped up for the day and really um, appreciate you joining me and all of your um, enthusiasm and encouragement and um, your, the, you know, this whole community of, of the art toolkit and expeditionary art for me is just wanting to, you know, share up.